ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so to continue with the ahkam or the rulings related to relieving oneself and we're discussing the last thing that we were discussing is the ruling on facing or turning one's back towards the qibla while um, relieving oneself. <clears throat> so we discussed that there's many opinions on this topic. The first opinion <clears throat> that we discussed was that it's, um, or one of the opinions that we discussed was that it's for- forbidden unrestrictedly. So regardless of whether it's facing or t- or turning your back or whether it's inside or outside, regardless the second was that it's the opposite, so that it's completely permissible regardless of wh- which way you're facing or which um, part of your body you have turned towards the Qibla, as well as regardless of whether it's indoors or outdoors. The third opinion that we discussed is that it's um, permitted <coughs> inside and forbidden outside. So this is the, these are the three opinions that we discussed already. The next opinion is that it's the forbiddance is in facing it and not turning want turning one's back towards the qibla. So if someone faces it, it's haram. But if they turn their back, then it's halal, um, and that this would be the ruling whether it's indoors or outdoors. <coughs> and this opinion is a narration from Imam Abu Hanifa as well as Imam Ahmad, and this is um, based upon the hadith that forbid the facing or turning one's back. However, they use the hadith of Ibn Umar that we discussed already as a or as an exception to the rule or that that this wouldn't apply to um, facing because or facing one's back because uh, we have the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar that he saw the Prophet ﷺ with his back towards the, the Qibla um, and uh, and then also we have his understanding in the other hadith where he himself um, was outdoors and then he or he attributed it to the Prophet ﷺ and he mentioned it so they extract from this specifically that the Prophet Sallallahu had his back and they don't necessarily take the part where Ibn Umar attributed it or um, discussed the reason for it being haram was that it was outdoors and if it was indoors it was halal. So they interpret it differently than the others did. So the others said that this hadith shows that indoors it's fine and outdoors it isn't. While this opinion, so the narration from Abu Hanifa and Ahmad that um, it's uh, related to whether it's the facing or the person's back is towards the Qibla. <clears throat> Another opinion is that, as we just mentioned, that it's forbidden indoors, or forbidden outdoors, and permissible. That it's forbidden outdoors, and indoors is also forbidden, only with facing. So what does this mean? This means that we take the ahadith in which the Prophet ﷺ forbid facing or having one's back towards the qibla while, while uh, re- relieving themselves. However, we also have the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar in which the Prophet ﷺ was indoors or he was inside some sort of building or some sort of structure and he had his back towards the qibla. Um, so with this they say that the only exception we have to the general rule that the Prophet ﷺ, when he forbid this, is that the only exception is that he was indoors and turned his back towards the Qibla. So we can't say that having the back outside is an exception because this hadith doesn't include that. And we can't also say that turning towards the Qibla or facing it indoors is an exception because that's also not in the hadith. So they stick exactly to what was in this hadith and they say that this is the only um, the only uh, exception and this it's also a narration from Imam Ahmad and Abu Hanifa before him and it was the opinion of Abu Yusuf al-Ansari who was the one of the main students of Abu Hanifa like we mentioned many times before and from some of the current day scholars uh, Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin held this as opinion as well and this is the argument that they make the next opinion is that it's forbidden, unrestrictedly, so facing, turning the back, indoors or outdoors, but it would also include um, the abrogated Qibla, so meaning to Bayt al-Maqdis. 
Um, and this is the opinion of Muhammad ibn Sirin and, Muhammad, or, and Ibrahim al Nakhai and others. And what the argument that's used for this, first there's a weak hadith. It's narrated by um, Abu Dawood in his Sunan. Um, that uh, from uh, Ma'aqal al-Asadi that he said Naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and nastaqbil al-qiblatayn bi bawlin aw ghaiq or that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid facing the two qiblas during urination or defecation so this hadith according to if, if, if it was authentic it would indicate that the facing would be towards both qiblas. So someone could make the argument with this hadith that facing would be both, would apply to both. And because we have the other hadith that mention, um, which are authentic, that also forbid um, turning one's back towards the qibla, then one argument that could be made is that this, this, this would, if you combine the two hadith, that it would show that, um, uh, it's, that it's forbidden to face and to turn one's back towards the qibla also someone could argue that um, if it's urination or there's forbidden to to face the two qiblas with urination or defecation so someone could make the argument that what is being meant is that the um, place of urination while it's taking place shouldn't face the qibla likewise the place of defecation shouldn't face the qibla while that's taking place or in this hadith that it would be both qiblas and as we said this hadith was narrated by um, Abu Dawood um, in his Sunan, it, but it was declared weak by Ala ad-Din Mughlatay and Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and from the current day scholars of Hadith, um, Muhammad Nasir ad-Din al-Albani. And as we see, obviously, first of all, this Hadith is weak, so it's not usable. Secondly, the authentic Hadith only mention the one Qibla, which is our Qibla. Also, the fact that it's um, abrogated, meaning it's no longer our Qibla, so we wouldn't attribute anything to that. And also, we don't continue to revere this this qibla as a qibla or as a, even a remnant of a qibla, as we know in the narrations when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiAllahu anhu, when they conquered Bilad al-Sham and they took over Bayt al-Maqdis, and in some of the narrations they were trying to figure out where to, how to build or rebuild or fix up the masjid as, as and and so one of the <coughs> scholars of the Tabi'in um, mentioned that it should be. It would be better to make it to, uh, behind the qibla or the abrogated qibla, so that the Muslims would be facing both. So they would, you know, because if they're behind the one qibla, facing Mecca, then they would be facing both. And Umar ibn Khattab radiAllahu anhu rejected this opinion and uh, disregarded it, despite the fact that at one time it was the qibla. And the last opinion is that it's disliked. So meaning it's not haram to face or turn one's back, but it would only be disliked. And this is the opinion of Al-Qasim ibn Ibrahim. And it's also a narration from Imam Abu Hanifa and Abu Thawr and Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And what they use for this is also the general rule that we know that if we have a text that forbids something, and then we have another text that would show that it's permitted, then the, the one of the rules that's used is that the text that permits it shows that the forbiddance in the first text which forbids it isn't actually for tahrim or for to make it haram or, or that it's forbidden, but it would only be uh, to, to, to show that it's disliked. So this is their way of reconciling. So we see there's a number of ways of reconciling. Some say that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ turning his back towards the qibla while, while urinating shows that um, it's disliked and not forbidden unrestrictedly like this others say that this shows that in the building it's okay outside it isn't others say that it shows that <clears throat> um, that uh, the only exception to it is um, turning one's back and not facing and others might say that the, the exception or this shows that the only exception is turning one's back indoors so it all comes down to how one reconciles between these ahadith <clears throat> as well as the understanding of Abdullah ibn Umar in the hadith that we mentioned from him as well. Allahu Alam, it's, you know, because of the, the great dispute amongst the ulama, it's, sometimes it's tough to see which is the stronger opinion or which is the stronger way to reconcile. Definitely, 
the strongest opinions in general that we would say is that one, that it's forbidden absolutely. And the reason for that is we know for a fact that at one time, before the Prophet ﷺ forbid these things, they would have been halal. Because nothing is haram until proven haram or until the Prophet ﷺ forbids it. So we know at one time it was halal to face the qibla and to turn one's back until the Prophet ﷺ forbid it. So for someone to say, or if someone makes the argument that we know that it was halal, and we know that he did this, so it's very likely that this took place before he forbid it, it's very possible. However, when we know for sure that he forbid it, then it shouldn't be, um, uh, we shouldn't disregard his clear statement with an action that we don't know the reason for it, or we don't know what was the exact uh, cause or the exact time when it was done and so on. We don't know the details of it. Likewise, because if someone was to say, well, this hadith of Ibn Umar narrating that the Prophet ﷺ had his back towards the qibla and he um, was indoors. So someone, as we saw, that some, one of the arguments is that the only exception is indoors with the back because this is the hadith. If someone came and said, well, no, the only, this, the, the, this is something that is only done in Medina. Because he was only doing it in Medina. We don't know, is this something that would be permitted in another city, in another country? Do we know if this was only the Prophet wasallam? Was it something specific for him? All these other arguments, although many of them might be weak, someone could make the argument and say that, because we don't know these things, why wouldn't we add these extra conditions? Why are we stopping at it being indoors and... Um, uh, with turning the back. So, Allah Alam, the strongest opinion is that it's not allowed. The second strongest, or one of the strongest opinions as well, would be the one that makes the exception to um, only turning the back indoors. Because this is all that we have narrated. So it's possible someone could say, well, this shows that the Prophet ﷺ made an exception to this. Another strong opinion out of the ones that we mentioned is that um, it would be disliked because the Prophet ﷺ did it. However, someone could also make the argument that this was, wasn't something that he expected people to see. So it wasn't something that he was doing so that people would know the ruling of it. Because first of all, we know that the Prophet ﷺ would go far when relieving himself. We also know <coughs> that... Um, that uh, uh, that he would cover himself. Ibn Umar didn't just happen to see it, he had climbed on the, on the top of uh, the house of Hafsa radiallahu anha. So this was something that, it wasn't as though the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did something out in the open <coughs> for all people to see so that they would know that it was um, uh, permissible for them to do so or that it was only disliked for them to do these types of things. Likewise, we don't know the condition, it's possible someone could argue that the Prophet ﷺ maybe had an injury or something like this, so he needed to sit, or he needed to sit on something. So he was sitting on something, and it happened to be that this thing was facing, or had its back, or it was built in a way that his back would be facing uh, the Qibla. So Allahu Alam, definitely the safest opinion is to never do it. And then the ones that would permit the least things that contradict the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he forbid them, would be the stronger ones in that order. So this is about facing and turning one's back towards the qibla while urinating or defecating. The next thing that the author says is he says, one should seek a soft and low piece of ground to protect himself from impurities. So while one is relieving oneself, he should select or he should choose... Um, a type of ground to use that would be least likely for him to um, get any najasa splash back on him or, or anything like this. Then he mentions, he says, Abu Musa narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or he mentions a hadith from Abu Musa that he said, مَا لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِلَى دَمْثٍ إِلَى جَنْ بِحَائِطْ فَبَالْ وَقَالْ إِذَا بَالَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَرْتَدْ uh, or that Abu Musa narrated that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came to a low and soft part of the ground and urinated. Then he said, 
when one of you urinates, he should choose the proper place to do so. And then he says, this is related by Ahmed and Abu Dawood. One of its narrators is unknown, but its meaning is sound. So this hadith, he mentioned that it's one of the narrators is, is unknown. So this is a cause for, or this is a defect in the hadith. It's the person would be majhul or unknown. Um, and this hadith was it was weakened by um, al-Shawkani, Nail al-Awtar, and uh, Sheikh al-Albani in Laif al-Jami'. However, um, there's other evidences for this. So first of all, there's a consensus. And this was mentioned by Imam al-Nawawi in al-Majmur. So there's a consensus <clears throat> that someone should choose the best area or the least likely area for him to urinate on that would cause any sort of splashback or cause himself to be uh, soiled by this urine. Secondly, there's a hadith, um, or there's the general hadith, uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where it's from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, that he said, "Marra al-Nabiyyu sallallahu alaihi wasallam bi qabrain, faqal inna huma la yuzibani wa ma yuzibani fi kabir." Or that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed by two graves, and he said, "These two people are being tortured, and they are not being tortured for something big," meaning that the thing that they're being tortured for wasn't a big thing to 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 to. Um, avoid or a difficult thing to avoid and then he continued and he said or that then he said as for the first then he did not use to protect himself from uh, being soiled by urine um, and then he says while the other used to go amongst the people and perform namima or backbiting and then the hadith continues, or Ibn Abbas continues, and he says, ثُمَّ أَخَذَ جَرِيلَةً رَطَبَةً فَشَقَّهَا نِصْفَيْنِ فَغَرَزَ فِي كُلِّ قَبْرٍ وَاحِدًا قَالُوا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لِمَا فَعَلْتَ هَذَا قَالَ لَعَلَّهُ يُخَفِّفُ عَنْهُمَا مَا لَمْ يَيْبَسَا Or that, uh, then the, Ibn Abbas says that the Prophet Sallam, then he took a green leaf of a, from a date palm or a date tree, or palm tree, and he split it in two, and he put one in each grave, or on each grave. Then they said, O Messenger of Allah, why have you done so? Um, or why, why, why have you done this? So he said, the meaning of which is, I hope that their punishment might be lessened until these become dry. And this hadith is narrated by al-Bukhari um, and Muslim, and this is uh, one of al-Bukhari's phrasings. And then there's many other hadith on this topic, uh, but most of them are weak. So we know that in general, someone is required to protect himself from urinating, urinating um, or um, uh, having splashback on himself while urinating. So if this is, is the case in general, then we know that whatever would fulfill this would become obligatory. If it's obligatory to do something, and we know the rule um, that anything, anything that's obligatory, that requires something in order to be fulfilled, then that thing or that requirement or prerequisite also becomes obligatory. So, um, you know, if, if the only way you can protect yourself from something haram is by, pro by doing something else, then that thing would also become obligatory to do. And this is, um, you know, this is more than sufficient on this uh, topic that the author mentioned. The next thing he says is, one should not use a hole in the ground. And he narrates the hadith from Qatada, from Abdullah ibn Sarjas, that he said, Naha, aw nuhiya, an yubala fil, fil, fil jahr. Or, and then he's, or he said, it was forbidden, or the, uh, it, it was forbidden, or the author says, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, forbade, forbade. But the actual hadith says that the, um, it was forbidden. So it doesn't attribute it to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but obviously we know that according to the strongest opinion of the scholars, that if um, something is mentioned, or if a Sahabi mentions something that it was forbidden by, or that it was forbidden to do such and such, or such and such was forbidden, or it was commanded to perform such and such, or such and such was commanded or was ordered, then we know that the strongest opinion is that this is, um, we attribute this to the Prophet ﷺ, unless we have evidence to show otherwise. Because the point of the Sharia, or the Sharia obviously only comes from the Prophet So the Sahaba were knowledgeable enough to know 
that they were conveying the Sharia. If they said such and such was forbidden, obviously the first thing that the person who's hearing them is going to think or attribute it to is the Prophet wasallam. As opposed to if it was something that they were talking about, for example, uh, that something took place during the time of Abu Bakr or Omar or Uthman or Ali and that they commanded this, then they would have said Abu Bakr commanded this or in the time of Abu Bakr, such and such was forbidden so obviously it wouldn't be from the Prophet ﷺ. So we can't attribute to the Sahaba that they were unaware enough to attribute something to the Prophet ﷺ or to, to use a phrase that would be understood as a, going back to the Prophet ﷺ, um, but they would use it haphazardly in this way and that it wouldn't be, uh, or that they would you know attribute things other, to other than the Prophet ﷺ, but use a phrasing that was unclear like this. In any case, the hadith... From uh, to repeat it, that Qatada narrated from Abdullah bin Sarjas that um, he said, or that he naha an yubala fil juhur, or that uh, in some of the narrations it says an Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Or so some of them attributed directly to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and others don't. However, it's mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade urinating into a hole. Then it says, qala, um, uh, or that it was said. Uh, um, or قيل لقتادة or قالوا لقتادة ما يكره من البول في الجحر قال كان يقال إنها مساكن الجن or that it was said to قتادة and why would it be forbidden to urinate in a hole so then قتادة said it is said that it is the, the dwellings or the place where jinn live um and then the author continues and says, This hadith is related by Ahmad, and nasai Abu Dawood, Al-Hakim, and Al-Bayhaqi. And Ibn Khuzayma and Ibn al Sakan classified it as um, Sahih. So just to add to this, the hadith is clear. We mentioned that if, if it's confirmed that it says that the Messenger of Allah Wasallam forbid it, then there's no, there's no concern. If it doesn't, and it's a Sahabi saying, um, that uh, that the prophet that it was it, such and such was forbidden. Then we know that the default is that it goes back to the prophet وسلم, unless we have evidence to show otherwise. The second thing is there's a dispute about the authenticity of this hadith. So even though our author mentions that it was authenticated by Ibn Khuzayma and Ibn al second, there's there's a dispute on the authenticity of this hadith, and this is based upon whether Qatada heard from Abdullah ibn Sarjas. So in some narrations, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal mentioned that he did not hear from him, and Ali ibn al-Madini said that he did. Um, so there's a dispute on the authenticity of it. So we have scholars from the Salaf, or from the Mutaqaddimin, or the early scholars of Hadith, differing on whether this Hadith um, would be uh, attributed to the Prophet ﷺ due to this defect. Um, and this hadith was authenticated by an Nawawi and Ibn al Mulaqin, so an Nawawi and al Khulasa and Ibn al Mulaqin al Badr al Munir, and Ibn Kathir um, said that it's authentic according to the conditions of the two sheikhs, so Bukhari and Muslim, in his book Rashad al Faqih, um, but al Albani weakened it based upon this, this argument um, in, in his book Laif, Abi Dawood, or Laif, son Abi Dawood. Um, and elsewhere, and Allahu Alam, the, the opinion that Qatada didn't hear from Abdullah ibn Sarjas, Allahu Alam, it seems to be a, the stronger opinion. Um, so, Allahu Alam, you know, we would go with this and say that the hadith isn't confirmed from the Prophet, Sallallahu but Imam al Nawawi, in his book Al Majmu'ah, he mentioned that there's a consensus that this action is disliked. So even though the hadith is weak, we would say that it's disliked, and there's a number of reasons why this would be. So first of all, there could be an animal living in that, in that place. So at this point, you're placing najasa on an animal, which is, a type of, which is definitely a type of harm, and you're bothering this animal for no reason, when you could have easily gone and used an area beside it. Likewise, the animal could come out of the hole, hurt this person, could spread this najasa to this person or elsewhere, and so on. So, in any case, it would be disliked to do so, um, and this this is you know sufficient, inshallah, to discuss uh, 
on this topic or on this thing that the author mentioned. The next thing that the author says is one should avoid shaded places and those places where people walk and gather. And then he mentions the hadith um, from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said um, uh, that the Prophet, or that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said <coughs> Uh, or he translated, or it's translated here as "Beware of those acts which cause others to curse." They asked, "What are those acts?" He said, "Relieving yourself in the people's walkways or in their shades." Or from Abu Hurairah that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ittaqul la ainain, qalu wa man la ainani ya Rasulullah, qal al ladhi yatakhla fi tariq al nas aw zillihim, or aw fi zillihim, depending on the narration." So. Um, so, and then he says, narrated by Ahmed, Muslim, and Abu Dawood. So this hadith is authentic. It's narrated by Muslim and these others as well. Um, with regards to what's the ruling of this act, there's three opinions, or two, depending on how we divide it. So, the first is that it's disliked, and it's not haram. And um, the... Uh, the, the, that is disliked, um, and this is the opinion of the Ahnaf, some of the Malikiya, most of the Shafi'iyya, and it's a narration from Imam Ahmad. The second opinion is that it's haram, and that's the opinion of some of the Malikis as well. Um, and Nawawi from the Shafi'iyya held this opinion, and it's a narration from Imam Ahmad. The evidence that they use is that this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, fear or stay away or beware of the two things that cause people to curse. And then he mentioned what they were. So he's forbidding you, or he's be saying beware, or stay away, or however we want to translate it. So he's telling us not to do so. Secondly, if we look to what would this act would cause, or the harm that would come from this, then we know that this, this would also be um, uh, something that would that would cause it to be closer to be, being haram, or it would be outright haram, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَكْتَسَبُ فَقَدْ اِحْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا." Or that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, which that which means, and those who annoy the believing men and women undeservedly bear upon themselves the crime of slander and pain and plain sin. Um, uh, the, and this is from Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 58. And then there's a number of um, hadith on this topic as well, uh, but they're weak. Um, so, you know, this is sufficient. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ told us to beware, to stay away from these things, the fact that there's a harm in it for the Muslims, uh, would be enough to make it haram. As for the reason why it wouldn't be, then, uh, then um, you know, this could come back to some rule, a rule that some scholars mention that any forbiddance that comes with in the in the the uh, relating to adab or etiquettes, then it wouldn't be haram; it would be disliked. And any command that comes relating to um, uh, etiquettes would be mustahab, and it wouldn't be obligatory. So they would say that this is a matter of etiquette, so it wouldn't be forbidden; it would be. Disliked. In Allah Alam, there's no evidence or there's no strong evidence for this rule. The Prophet ﷺ came to teach us everything, ibadah and etiquette and so on, contracts, um, how to deal with each other, and on and on and on. If the Prophet ﷺ forbids something, the default is that it's haram until we have evidence. So we don't have any clear evidence to change this from being haram to, to disliked. So we would stick with it being, um, uh, being uh, haram until someone proves otherwise. So the second opinion, um, which was, as we said, some of the Malikiya, a narration from Imam Ahmad, and and now will be from the Shafi'iya, would be the stronger opinion on this topic as well. Next, the author says, um, one may not urinate while standing. Then he says, if a person can guarantee that no impurities will touch his clothes, it is permissible to urinate while standing. Then he mentions a hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha that she said, 
من حدثكم أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بال قائما فلا تصدقوه ما كان يبول إلا جالسا or that um, Aisha رضي الله عنها said um, if someone tells you or whoever tells you that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم urinated while standing then do not believe him he did not used to urinate except while sitting and then he says this hadith is narrated by the five Except Abu Dawood. And as we talked about before, the five would be Abu Dawood, Al-Tirmidhi, Al-Nasai, Ibn Majah, and Ahmad. So all of these five minus Abu Dawood. So Al-Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Al-Nasai, and Ahmad. Then he says, Al-Tirmidhi's comment is, It is the best thing related to this point, and it is the most authentic. Um, and then just to talk about this hadith, um, uh, this hadith it was uh, narrated by a Tirmidhi and it ter- contains a narrator named Shuraik, who was a weak narrator. But uh, there's another chain in which Sufyan is in his place. So it would be an acceptable um, hadith. Um, and it was also narrated by Ahmed as well and others. The next thing that he mentions is uh, the hadith um, uh, from, uh, or he says, uh, one should not forget that what Aisha said is based upon uh, the knowledge that she had. So he's saying that Aisha radiallahu anha, obviously everyone narrates with you know based upon their knowledge. They can't narrate on something they don't know. So if someone says this never happened or this is the only thing that happened, then this is obviously based upon, it's possible that there's other information, but this is based upon what they know. So then he goes on to mention a hadith of Hudayfa to show that it actually did happen. So, you know, the, the statement of Aisha isn't absolute. There could be exceptions to it. And he brings evidence to one of these exceptions. And he says, Hudayfa narrates that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, went to a public garbage dump and urinated while standing. And he says, Hudayfa went away and the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, called him over. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, made wudu and wiped over his shoes. And he says, related by the group. So this hadith that he's mentioning is is uh, so it's narrated by the group um, what it is. So it's obviously authentic. So from An Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu, or the full hadith in Arabi is An Hudayfa. قال كنت مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فانتهى إلى سباطة قوم فبال قائما فتنحيت فقال أدنه فدنوت حتى قمت عند عقبيه عقبيه فتوضأ فمسح على خفيه or that so what the author mentioned except this hadith says the the khuf not the shoes so this um, is a is something translated or mistranslated or inaccurately translated so then he says and now what we said while commenting on this issue to urinate while sitting is most desirable in my opinion but to do so standing is permissible both acts are confirmed by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so with regards, so he's proving or he's mentioning that it's confirmed that the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, he urinated while sitting. And there's no dispute about this, but there's also evidence that he did so while standing. So there's two opinions based upon these texts as well as others. So the first opinion is that it's disliked. So the person shouldn't do so. If they intentionally avoid urinating while uh, standing, then they would be rewarded. But if they did so while standing, they wouldn't be sinful, but they would be losing out on rewards. And this is the opinion of the Ahnaf, um, the Shafi'iyah. It's also a narration from Imam Ahmad and some of the Malikiyah. They say that it's recommended to sit. So what they use is the hadith that the author mentioned from, from Aisha radiallahu anha. Then they also mention the hadith from uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, radiallahu anhu that he said, رآني النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنا أبول قائما فقال يا عمر لا تبول قائما فما بلت قائما بعد or that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم saw me urinating while standing so he said O oh, Umar do not urinate while standing so I did not urinate standing after that so they use this as well that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم forbade it so this is obviously a strong evidence that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم forbade uh, urinating while standing. However, uh, or this hadith is narrated by Tirmidhi and others, but there's an agreement that it's a weak hadith. It was weakened by Tirmidhi himself in Al-Jamr, 
It was also weakened by Ibn Adi in Al Kamil fi Dhu'afar Rijal and Al Bayhaqi in Al Sunan Al Kubra and Ibn Al Qaysarani in the Khirat Al Huffaz and elsewhere. So there's an agreement that it's weak, so it's obviously not usable. Um, so we would disregard this. They also use um, the uh, the hadith, or it's a hadith, or it's attributed to the Prophet ﷺ from Burayda, that he said, or that the Prophet ﷺ said, ثَلَاثٌ مِنَ الْجَفَاءِ أَنْ يَبُولَ الرَّجُلُ قَائِمًا أَوْ يَمْسَحْ جَبْهَتَهُ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَفْرَغْ uh, يَفْرُغْ مِنَ صَلَاتِهِ أَوْ يَنْفُخْ فِي سُجُودِهِ Or that the Prophet ﷺ, it's attributed to him that he said three things are from staleness. That a man urinates while standing, wiping the dirt off of the forehead before finishing the salat or his salat, and blowing out during sujood. And this hadith was narrated by al-Bukhari in al-Tariq al-Kabir, and al-Tabarani in al-Mu'jam al-Awsat, but it's also weak. It was declared weak by Ibn Rajab in his book Fath al-Bari, and Ibn al-Mulaqin in his his commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, and al-Shawkani in Nail al-Awtar, and al-Mubarak Furi in Tuhfat al-Ahwadi, and elsewhere, or and, and other, by others as well. So this hadith is also weak. So, so far we don't have anything from the Prophet's words forbidding um, uh, urinating uh, or giving or attributing any sort of bad character or any sort of bad, uh, you know, um, attribute to urinating while standing. Then they also mention a hadith from Jabir ibn Abdullah, that he said, نَهَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنْ يَبُولَ الرَّجُلُ قَائِمًا Or that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم forbid that a man urinate while standing. And this is narrated by Ibn Majah, but it's also a weak hadith as well. The chain contains Adi ibn al-Fadl. So, so far we see that there's nothing authentic from the Prophet ﷺ about not urinating while standing. What we have is that he would do so while sitting, as well as that the vast majority of the times when he would do so, he would do so while uh, sitting and not standing. Um, and then there's other hadith that are either as weak or weaker than these on, on the topic of forbidden, so they don't, uh, or there's no, there's no reason to mention them. <clears throat> However, those who say, or those who say that it's forbidden, or those who would argue that... Um, uh, it's only, or it's not, um, it's not liked, it's disliked. They argue against the hadith of Hudayfa in a number of different ways. So one is that they say it's mansukh, or that it's abrogated, so it no longer applies. However, there's no evidence to prove this. So someone might say that, you know, it was this was something that originally was allowed, like we talked about in the previous, or a few topics ago, but this shows that it would be um, abrogated. So first of all, we would say that there's no evidence to show that it's haram, so there's no need to look to it being um, abrogated or not. So, you know, this is obviously, it's no longer, we don't need to go into the issue of abrogation when there's nothing authentic on its own or in, uh, you know, by, by combining all the narrations, there's also nothing authentic on the topic um, as well. Um... A second argument that they use is they'll say that the Prophet ﷺ, he only urinated while standing in this hadith due to the fact that he had an injury on the back of his knee. And this was mentioned by, or it was narrated, or, the, or there's evidence for this argument in a narration that was mentioned by a tirmidhi and Al-Hakim. But this hadith or this, this narration of the story um, that mentions this detail is weak. And it was weakened by Imam al darqutni and Al-Bayhaqi and others. So this can't be used as well. Um, and others say that he didn't have a place to sit. However, what we need to keep in mind is that had the forbiddance of urinating been, been proven, and then the Prophet wasallam did so standing, it's unlikely that he wasallam wouldn't explain why, or that Hudayfa, Anhu, knowing that there's a forbiddance, wouldn't have clarified to the people why he did so. So if it was due to not having a place to stand, or if it was due to an injury, or if it was due to, you know, it used to be forbidden and now it wasn't, or if, for whatever the case was, 
it's unlikely that a Sahabi would um, uh, not clarify the reason. This is on top of the fact that we don't have anything authentic. Um, uh, we don't have anything authentic to show that it's forbidden in the first place. If we did, then we would go into these other discussions and these arguments and, and, and have a discussion. But when there's nothing authentic, there's no reason to then say, well, if there was something authentic, then what would it be? And what do we say about that? And so on and so on. So this is the first opinion. The second opinion is that it's allowed to, to urinate while standing with the condition that the person is safe from having the urine splash onto him or something along these lines. So meaning that he won't become uh, dirtied by the najasa himself or on his clothing or anything like this. The first evidence that they use for this is they say, or sorry, and this is the opinion of the Malik of uh, of Malik and the majority of the Hanabila. So they use the Hadith of Hudayfa. So they say that we have evidence that it's confirmed that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi urinated while um, while standing. On top of the fact that we don't need evidence to show something is allowed, if we don't have anything to show that it's forbidden. If we had something to show it was forbidden, and then there was evidence to show it was allowed, then someone would have to argue that, that one of them, or that the permissibility cancels out the other one due to the, due to the, 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 um, the dates of when the forbiddens and the dates of when the uh, permissibility was shown, and so on. But since we don't have anything to forbid it, we stick to the default, which is that everything's allowed. But, as we know, protecting oneself from urine is also obligatory. So, if the person is safe, then this is when this opinion would apply. They also mention a narration from uh, Zayd, radiallahu anhu, that he said, رَأَيْتُ عُمَرَ بَالَ قَائِمًا Or, I saw Umar urinating while standing. And this is narrated by Ibn Abi Shayba. And the chain itself is authentic. Um, so this uh, would be evidence that Umar radiallahu anhu understood it as well. Again, if we had a forbiddance, then it's possible for us to say the actions or the statements of the Sahaba aren't evidence in the in the presence of a text from the Wahi, which is obviously um, would be in general would be correct. But we don't have anything authentic to forbid it. Then we have evidence from the Prophet ﷺ urinating while standing. Then we also have evidence from the Sahaba showing that they understood this from his actions or from the lack of evidence for forbidden. So we have from Umar. Then we also have a narration from uh, Abu Dhabiyan, rahimahullah, that he said, رَأَيْتُ عَلِيًّا بَالَ قَائِمًا ثُمَّ تَوَضَّأْ وَمَسَحَ عَلَى نَعَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ أَقَامَ الْمُؤَذِّنْ فَخَلَعْهُمَا Or that from Abu Dhabiyan, Rahimahullah that he said, I saw Ali, so Ali ibn Abi Talib, urinating while standing. Then he performed wudu and he wiped over his sandals. Then the mu'addin established the salat, so he performed the iqama and he removed them. So Ali took off his uh, his na'al or his um, his sandals after um, the mu'addin made the iqama. Um, and this is narrated by Ibn Abi Shayba and it's an authentic hadith from Ali and it was declared so by Lalbani, and he said that it was authentic according to the conditions of the two shaykhs. So meaning Al-Bukhari and Muslim. So with all this evidence, we see that it's impossible for us to say that it's haram to urinate while standing, or even that it's disliked. All we say is that the person needs to do his best to protect himself from any sort of splashback on himself or his clothing, or from dirtying an area for another Muslim. If he's able to do so, then it would be permissible without any dislike. Um, so inshallah, we'll stop there. And then the next thing that we'll discuss will be that one must remove any impurities from his clothes and his body. Um, and then we'll finish up the uh, issues or some or some more of the issues on uh, relieving oneself. Wallahu alam.